Hey what's up guys? Today I'll show you a comedy fantasy film, Defending Your Life. Spoiler ahead, watch out and take care. The movie begins with an executive celebrating his 39th birthday with a comedic speech. His co-workers, who are laughing at his jokes, are gifted by him a fancy CD player and CDs all around. Afterward, his co-worker, a Jeep owner, drives him to a car dealership to get his brand new car. The Jeep owner asks the executive what his plans are for his birthday. The executive tells him that he just plans to drive around alone at night. He is proud to celebrate loneliness, because he is happy with where he is in life. The executive arrives at the car dealership, where a car salesman shows him the BMW convertible, and he buys it instantly. The executive drives home, and pops a CD into a player. He happily sings along while driving along the LA roads. A man driving behind him, angrily honks at him for playing his music loudly. The executive turns a corner, and some of his CDs slide out of his seat and onto the floor. He gets distracted and tries to get the CDs. He doesn't notice that he is swerving into the opposite lane, and a bus is quickly coming at him. The next moment, he is in a wheelchair beside an old man and woman, and they're being led around a hospital facility. The executive is catatonic, and a hospital orderly guide him as he gets seated in a tram. The tram guide inside the tram tells the executive and his fellow passengers that they're in Judgment City. She explains to them that they're no longer on Earth, but slowly and surely, they will soon adjust to their new surroundings. They soon arrive at the Continental Hotel, where the executive will stay. Bellhops escort him and other passengers into the hotel. The hotel manager reassures them that all they need to do is rest in their rooms. The executive enters his room, which looks like a standard hotel room, with wooden furnishings and beige beddings. A bellhop opens a closet, and shows him the two pots that he'll be wearing for the rest of his stay at Judgment City. After the bellhop leaves, the executive plops onto the bed and sleeps. The next morning he is woken by the ringing telephone. On the other end of the line is his defense attorney, who tells him that he is here to help the executive defend his life. He encourages the executive to enjoy Judgment City's amenities before their appointment at 11 a.m. The executive takes the attorney's advice and goes out of his hotel room to look for someplace to eat. He finds himself in a diner. He orders eggs and is bowled over by how delicious they are. Soon enough, it is time for him to get to town for his 11 a.m. appointment with his attorney. The attorney explains that when each human life ends, a group of people decide if they did enough good things in this lifetime. If they agree, the soul will be allowed to move forward. And if not, the soul will start a new life back on Earth. The executive will have one chance at a trial to prove that he is worthy of moving forward. The attorney also discloses that the executive has already lived 20 lifetimes. In fact, he encourages the executive to visit the past lives pavilion to see what kind of person he was in his previous lifetimes. After seeing an ad on the elevator, the executive visits a comedy club. There he meets a kind woman. He catches her attention by quipping at the man performing on stage. She approaches him and says that he looks familiar to her. They take a walk and continue their witty banner. He tells her that his trial might take up to nine days, and she shares that hers might take only four. They tell each other more details about their lives back on Earth. The executive was married before, while the kind woman had kids. The executive walks the kind woman back to her hotel. He is surprised to see that her accommodations are much more luxurious than his. This must be because she is more generous and kinder in her past life than he was. The next day, the executive meets his attorney at the judgment center for the first day of his trial. They enter a sparsely lit room where the prosecutor is waiting. A male and female judges enter the room next. They explain to the executive that this whole process will help them decide on his case. The prosecutor begins her argument by saying that the executive is still plagued by the same fears that have held him back in all his lifetimes. The prosecutor brings out the first evidence by showing the executive's childhood memory when he was 11 years old. In this memory, the executive was being bullied by another boy in the schoolyard playground. The boy was inciting him to fight back, but he never did. He was branded as a coward. The defense attorney, in turn, shows the judges another childhood memory of the executive. This time he is a young infant watching his parents argue. The attorney asserts that the executive is not ruled by fear, but by wisdom and restraint instead. The attorney now shows a scene from the executive's past memory when he's 10 years old. The young child had bravely lent his classmate his art supplies, and took on the ire of his teacher instead. He got into trouble for this, but he courageously saved his friend. The prosecutor counters this with another memory of the same day. 
The executive's father was berating him for the incident at school, saying that he would punish him. The executive quickly folds, and he admits that he took the blame for his friend. It turns out that his friend was expelled from the school two days later. The executive gets tired of the arguing in the courtroom, and announces that he is done for the day. Later that night, he visits a Japanese restaurant for dinner. He orders some sake, tuna and relishes the delightful taste. He meets a bookseller who is sitting next to him at the restaurant. He shares that he's in Judgment City for 15 days. Later the executive rides the tram home to the Continental Hotel. Back in his room, he finds out that the kind woman had left a message for him in the lobby. She wants him to meet her tomorrow after the proceedings. The next day, the executive finds out that his attorney couldn't make it, and that a substitute defense attorney will be filling in for him. He assures the executive that he knows what he's doing. This time the prosecutor begins with a memory from when the executive was 24 years old. It's shown that his investor friend had given him a juicy tip to invest in a Japanese watch company. However, he refused to believe that the Japanese company would ever take off. He chose to invest in cattle instead. It turns out the company became a huge success, and the executive missed out on a lot of money. His cattle venture is a failure. The prosecutor emphasizes that the executive does not make good judgments out of his fear. The prosecutor points to another memory, the executive wound up taking a salary so much lower than he anticipated. However, he did not even argue with his potential employer, but just flat out accepted the first offer. The prosecutor argues that this is again a classic case of the executive, being afraid to take a chance and advocate for his own interests. However, the substitute attorney never presents a counter-argument against that. The prosecutor keeps going, and presents a compilation of the many misjudgments that the executive had made in the past year. These include installing an antenna wrong, gargling with sanitary alcohol instead of mouthwash, and being duped while buying a car. After the day's proceedings, he finds the kind woman again in the hallway. She asks him to go with her to the past lives pavilion. The executive is hesitant, wondering if it's worth it to find out who he was in his previous lives. But eventually, they line up at the past lives pavilion, and while away the time by talking more about their lives. The line speeds up, and they're assigned their own individual booths. They are instructed to place their hand on a plate, and a holograph will appear to present their past lives. The executive sees that in his past life, he was a native man. Meanwhile, the kind woman was a chivalrous knight in her past life, on the way home the kind woman admits to him that she can't get him out of her mind. The executive also admits that as much as his proceedings are turning out badly, her presence makes him feel better. The pair goes to a mini golf course, where they share more things about themselves. The kind woman reveals to the executive that she died by tripping near a pool, and hitting her head on the pavement. The executive once again walks the kind woman home back to her hotel. She asks him out to dinner tomorrow night. The two share a passionate tongue massage. The next morning, the attorney is back. The prosecutor begins with a memory of the 34-year-old executive. He was tasked to deliver an important speech that could have advanced his career. But minutes before he was set to go on stage, he had a terrible case of stage fright. He was blinded by the lights and unnerved by the stares of the people. Thankfully, there was a gas leak under the venue, and he didn't have to give his speech. The prosecutor illustrates that the executive never spoke in front of a crowd ever again, his fear tightening its chokehold on him. To counter this, the attorney brings up the memory of the executive's snowmobile accident. He was zipping along the snowy mountain, when he was swerving and careened off a cliff. He broke his leg and crawled three miles to get help. The attorney argues that this is an example that the executive can overcome fear. Afterward, the executive goes inside the room, where the kind woman's proceedings are taking place. It turns out that even her prosecutor finds her endearing, as he doesn't argue with her as the executive's prosecutor does. The memory playing on screen depicts the kind woman saving her kids and dog from a burning house. All the people in the room are utterly charmed. That night they go out to dinner in an Italian restaurant. They dine on sumptuous food, until the executive realizes that the prosecutor is also in the same restaurant. He gives her a friendly nod that she returns. The kind woman starts slurping on her big tub of pasta, and the executive laughs at her easygoing attitude. The prosecutor looks at this scene curiously. The kind woman approaches the prosecutor's table, and introduces herself on the way to the bathroom. They leave with plenty of pies courtesy of the restaurant. They walk home and sit down in the kind woman's hotel lobby. The kind woman tells the executive that her lawyer told her that after tomorrow, she wouldn't be returning to the hotel anymore. 
she admits to the executive that she has never felt anything like she feels for him now. He reciprocates this feeling, and regrets that they had only met in this place, especially since they'd be going off into separate paths soon. She tells him that he loves her, and they share another tongue massage. She asks him to spend a hormone night with her, but the executive tells her that he is afraid of giving her a too fast hormone experience and what will happen after that. He bids her farewell and leaves. Upon arriving at his hotel, the executive calls the Majestic Hotel to leave a message for the kind woman. He realizes that he doesn't know her last name, and that there are two guests who share a similar first name. So he leaves them both the message that he loves her, and that he'll miss her. In his trial the next day, his attorney makes his final argument. He tells the story of the executive, who was downtrodden and impoverished after his divorce, choosing to go on the Hong Kong trip he and his wife were supposed to go on together. At the airport, he had chosen to splurge on upgrading his ticket, effectively choosing to listen to his own wants despite the circumstances. The attorney argues that it is a clear sign that he has overcome his fears, and is ready to move forward. However, the prosecutor replays a scene from the previous night, the executive turning down a hormone night with the kind woman, because he was afraid of losing the woman, as well as his too speedy impression he may show to the woman. For the prosecutor, this is another example of the executive's decisions being ruled by fear. But the attorney argues that this is him being selfless, and caring for another person. The executive explains that he died too young, but he believes that he did the best he could, and that he is worthy of moving forward. The court adjourns for the final time, and all they have to do is announce their decision. The executive and the attorney receive the decision in the latter's office. The attorney opens the envelope, and says to the executive that he will not be moving forward, but will be sent back to earth again. The attorney comforts him, and tells him that this decision does not mean he doesn't deserve to move forward. The attorney takes the executive to the station, where different trams transport souls back to Earth to start new lives. He boards a tram, forlorn and disappointed in himself. Suddenly, he notices the kind woman sitting on the bus next to him. At that exact moment, the trams start moving. The executive decides that his fears will no longer rule him. He leaves his moving bus, and attempts to get to the bus the kind woman is on. He crosses lanes full of oncoming traffic, and narrowly misses being run over. He finally makes it to the kind woman's bus doors, but they are locked. It turns out, the judges on his case are watching the whole thing play out on their screen. The executive's display of courage impresses them, and they order the bus doors to open. The movie ends with the executive and the kind woman reuniting and sharing a kiss, to the utter delight of the people with them on the bus. For the executive, defending his life became a chance to truly live it. The last scene ends as the bus barrels on, taking the couple back to Earth, to restore their hormonity together. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.